Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the DIM 400 section on spinal radiology. I'm Dr. Luru and I'll be lecturing the section. And in this lecture, we'll look at general spinal radiology, anatomy, congenital conditions, and spinal trauma at the end. So the lectures are broken down into introduction, spinal radiographic technique, vertebral anatomy, vertebral column evaluation, and then several congenital spinal conditions. Um, and then not on the slide, but trauma will come at the end. So first of all, it's important to determine if it's really a spinal case. And this can be done with a history. Um, possibly there was trauma involved and um, also looking at the signalment. For example, the Dachshund is a breed that's prone to intervertebral disc disease. The brachycephalic breeds may have the, the possibility of congenital vertebral anomalies. Clinical signs might include thorough or quadriplegia, thoracic or pelvic lumbaresis, ataxia, pain specifically referable to a specific lesion, stiffness, resistance to moving the neck. And then a neurological exam will help to localize the lesion. And then it's important to remember that some conditions may mimic spinal cord disease. For example, cranial cruciate ligament rupture, especially if it's bilateral. Other neurological conditions such as myasthenia gravis or even acute abdomen. So once we've determined that, yes, it is a spinal case, we need to do a clinical exam to be able to localize the lesions called neurolocalization. And this is generally split into lesions from C C1 to C5, C5 to T2, T3 to L3, or L4 to S3. And it's important to take survey radiographs of the region before jumping to more advanced imaging, such as CT or MRI. This is because the radiographs can actually already detect uh, a lot of important pathology, such as discospondylitis, fractures, luxations, degenerative changes, as well as changes in bone opacity and alignment. But if what is seen on the radiograph is only an incidental finding, or potentially the radiographs are negative, then one can move on to more advanced types of imaging. So once one finds that the survey radiographs are negative, we can consider other options, such as contrast studies, like myelography, CT, or MRI. Myelography is in, in illustrated in this first left-hand image, and that is when iodinated contrast images, um, contrast medium is injected into the subarachnoid space. So if you look carefully, the white line at the top or the opaque line is the dorsal column of, of contrast agents, and the bottom line or the bottom column is the, the ventral column, and in between is the spinal cord. So it gives an indirect visualization of the spinal cord. So it can be performed with practice, but it is an invasive procedure. One requires general anesthesia, and there might be complications associated with it, which we'll cover later. But luckily, a CSF sample can be collected at the same time, so that is a benefit. CT in this next image is very useful for evaluating bony abnormalities, such as bone lysis, new bone formation, or soft tissue mineralization. One can see in this image, this is um, transverse image through um, cervical vertebra one, and the bony D12 is excellent. Um, CT myelography can also be performed, similar to um, that performed with radiology, but obviously then transverse images can be acquired. These images then can be reformatted into sagittal or dorsal planes, or ED, even 3D imaging can be performed. Lastly, one can also choose to do MRI, MRI is very useful when looking at soft tissues, for example, neural tissues like the brain and the spinal cord, and can visualize findings not easily seen with other imaging modalities, such as neoplasia, hemorrhage, demyelinization, infarction, or inflammation. The limiting factor, though, is that it's currently not easily available to the private practitioner. Um, and aesthetic is quite prolonged, and the imaging studies take in excess of 30 minutes sometimes. So in this example of an MRI, there's a cross-sectional um, image through the, the spinal cord. This gray region is the cord itself. The white around it is the CSF and epidural fat. And this white lesion within the cord is um, a pathological lesion, probably edema. The black um, surrounding bits is the bone. And you can see that the bone detail with MRI is not great if one compares it to CT. 
So those are just some extra modalities that can be useful to evaluate the spine. So next we'll move on to some detail on spinal radiographic technique. Okay, getting optimal spinal um, radiographs is very important because one really needs maximum definition because um, les lesions can be quite subtle. So this is achieved by sedation or general anesthesia. This will, of course, help radiation safety because no one needs to be near the patient to hold them. And it'll eliminate patient movement, um, especially from respiration. Um, well, eliminate patient uh, motion. You won't get rid of respiration, but um, it's usually not a problem. And will help for accurate positioning. And also, if myelography needs to be performed afterwards, one can go and do that. One needs to collimate to prevent scatter from reaching the cassette. Um, and then also a grid is mandatory to reduce scatter. And usually one needs to center at the region of interest, but a little bit more on that later. Positioning, we also use, make a use of a lot of foam pads and positioning devices. Um, this is because it's important to have the spine parallel to the tabletop and then parallel to the cassette, especially if you want to compare the widths of the intervertebral disc spaces. So positioning aids are usually placed for the cervical spine under the muzzle and under the neck, like in the first picture, or in the hollow between the ribs and the pelvis for lumbar and thoracolumbar studies. Um, and then also beneath the lower front or back limb, and also underneath the sternum to get the median plane of the patient parallel to the cassette. So this next slide demonstrates that quite nicely. On the top right hand side, if the patient is allowed to lie in natural recumbency, um, the spine will invariably form these natural curves and we can eliminate them and get the spine to be straight by using foam pads. And the same um, with uh, this bottom picture. It demonstrates the reason why we use foam pads underneath the thorax and between the legs to also just get the spine or the vertebra to align um, with the cassette adequately. Just on a side note, it's important when evaluating these images that the patient's head always faces to the left. It's exactly the same for thorax and abdomen. And then to know that you have a well-positioned true lateral view, there will be superimposition of several anatomical structures. And you can come back to this slide once we've covered the anatomy a little bit. But the wings of the atlas, the transverse processes of C6, the rib origins, the lumbar transverse processes, and the wings of the ilia will all be superimposed. So the two standard views for neutral position of the spine are the lateral views and the VD. And the centering is usually done over an identifiable lesion if that can be done. Otherwise, if no localizing signs are present, then survey radiographs can be taken of the spine. And these are usually centered over the mid cervical region, the mid thoracic region, the thoracolumbar junction, the mid lumbar area, and the lumbosacral junction. And also, just an aside note on uh, the correct terminology for the lateral views a right lateral means the patient is lying on his right side, a left lateral means that they're lying on their left side. So, this is a bit different um, when you think about how we talk about the entry to exit point of the beam. So the correct terminology for a right lateral would actually be a left to right lateral. The beam enters the patient's left hand side and exits the right hand side. But we shorten it by saying a right lateral because it's just easier and shorter to say. There are several extra dynamic views of the spine that can be performed. Some of these we only do if we are performing um, myelography. But they include hyperextension or dorsiflexion. That's when the neck is almost bent backwards. And that will accentuate any dorsal cord compression, for example, ligamentum flavum hypertrophy, which we'll get to um, when we cover the section on the neck. Um, ventral flexion, if, where the whole cervical spine is curved, helps uh, to determine if there's subluxation or not, and to look for ventral um, or for disc protrusion, especially during myelography. Flexion of the atlantoaxial joint is centered around um, the atlantoaxial area, and that is to look for instability of this region, but it must be performed very carefully as not to exacerbate clinical signs. Traction views are when 
the um, head and shoulders are essentially pulled in opposite direction and that will help to differentiate between herniated disc material or proliferation of the annulus fibrosis. Um, and more on, on this will be discussed once we get to that section. The oblique views we will cover a little bit under anatomy, but um, they're important for myelography to identify dorsolateral or ventrolateral compressions, which are not seen on the standard VD and lateral views, and also to look at the intervertebral foramina. Right, the next section we're just going to be covering a little bit of vertebral anatomy. So the vertebral column um, for dogs and cats is quite standard. There's not often much variation, but it consists of seven cervical, 13 thoracic, seven lumbar, and three sacral vertebra. Um, the sacral segments are fused, and there's various number of tail vertebra, coccygeal or caudal. It's important to be aware anatomically that the normal spinal cord ends at mid L6, and so the spinal cord segments don't actually correspond to the vertebra. For example, spinal cord segment of L6 is located at the caudal aspect of the L4 vertebra. It's also important to remember that there are, for example, eight cervical spinal nerves, but only seven vertebra present. So please refer back to anatomy and also then the medicine neurology course for this. The first part we're going to be looking at is the vertebral body. Um, this is that cylindrical part and the bulkiest part of the vertebra. And in immature animals at the cranial and caudal end plates, a radiolucent physis will be demonstrated. And that will be seen in this next slide. This is a skeletally immature patient. And these radiolucent lines seen cranially and caudally and also on the VD cranially and caudally are physial lines. And the reason why it's radiolucent is because it's composed of physial cartilage and cartilage is radiolucent, which means it's not visible on, on a radiograph as an opaque structure. The next structure is the pedicle. Um, the pedicle consists of the thinner vertical bones that form the lateral borders of the vertebral canal. The articulation facets will form the true joints of the vertebral column, which means they've got articulation or articular cartilage, a synovial lining and synovial fluid. And their orientation differs according to which anatomical part of the spine we're looking at. In the lumbar spine, such as in this image, um, the articulation facets are medial and lateral. And so it creates a joint space that is seen as a curved radiolucent line. And we can see that on this radiograph. As this curved structure here. In the cervical spine though, the articular surfaces are dorsal and ventral, so the joint space runs obliquely across the vertebral canal. And we will see this on um, this slide of the cervical spine. These oblique radiolucent lines are the joints of the cervical spine. The intervertebral foramina are those radiolucent areas um, in between the pedicle, and they essentially are sort of a, a window into the vertebral canal. And this is where the spinal nerves enter, or the spinal nerves, nerves exit. Um, in a lumbar spine like this, it's got the appearance almost of a horse's head. And um, in the thoracic spine, these intervertebral foramina are poorly visualized because the ribs superimpose over them. And in the cervical area, they're really not seen except for at C2 to 3 because they open ventrolaterally versus the lumbar spine here, they open laterally. Again, I've just added a slide here to demonstrate the difference between the two. In the lumbar spine, we can see the foramina very, very clearly. In the cervical spine, only C2 to 3 is actually seen, whereas the rest of the um, spaces or the foramina are not visualized. The intervertebral disc space is that radiolucent area that's present um, between the intervertebral or in between um, the vertebral bodies. And um, they are, it's important not to call them a joint. A lot of people make the mistake of calling them intervertebral joints, but the true joints are the one that's ones that I've previously discussed. 
Okay, the lamina forms the roof of the vertebral canal, and um, one can see its dorsal margin of the canal is this thin sclerotic line. And um, the vertebral canal will widen slightly at the cervical and the lumbar intumescence because that's where the brachial plexus and the lumbosacral plexus originate and the cord is wider in those areas. So one might get a little bit of widening of this vertebral canal. Spinous processes um, are mainly for muscle attachment and they originate um, from the, the lamina dorsally. And the transverse processes are also for muscle attachment and they originate on the lateral vertebral body. And important to note in the orientation here, they do superimpose over the intervertebral disc space and that creates a bit of a mineralized region and it's important not to confuse this with an intervertebral disc that might be mineralized. Right, so on this slide, I've got a bit of a self quiz that you can do. Um, you can name the structures labeled one to eight. And I'll give you a couple of seconds. Otherwise, please just hit the pause button um, before I give the answers. Okay, so here are the answers. Number one is the vertebral body. Number two is the pedicle. Number three is the intervertebral disc space. Number four is the intervertebral foramina. Number five is the dorsal spinous process. Number six is the articulation facets making up the joint. Number seven is the lamina. And number eight is a transverse process. In this one, you can also do a quick self-assessment. Just label the parts defined from left to right by the red circles. And I'll just give you a few seconds again. All right, the answers are number one, the first circle is um, the proximal rib that is superimposed over the intervertebral disc. Um, number two is a transverse process that's also superimposed over the intervertebral disc space. And number three is the intervertebral foramina. And here one can clearly see the horse head shape. And part of the horse head is formed by this little mineralized opacity um, protruding into it. And this is an accessory process. All right, then I've got one last slide of self-assessment. Um, also, just name the anatomical parts uh, depicted by the numbers, and I'll give you a few seconds. All right, the answers are as follows. Number one is the vertebral body. Number two is the pedicle. So the pedicle is de difficult to demonstrate um, on the VD because it's such a fine, thin vertical bone. Remember, it forms the lateral margins of the vertebral canal. But over here, one can also see a thin um, sort of radiopaque line, mineralized line over there. So that is the pedicle. Number three is the intervertebral disc space. Number four is the articulation process or the joint. Number five is the dorsal spinous process, and number eight is a transverse process. So some vertebral have um, specific characteristics that might help you identify them as such. For example, C6 has got a very prominent transverse process indicated down here. That's also known as the ventral lamina. What else we can see on this radiograph is that C2 typically has a very, very large dorsal spinous process. So we always know that C2. And then T1 is the vertebra with the first um, very prominent, uh, very tall dorsal spinous process. Looking at the intervertebral disc spaces, T10 to 11 might often be narrow. And that's, this is because T11 is the anticlinal vertebra. Now, what that means is that if you look at the thoracic vertebras, dorsal spinous processes, they are angled caudally versus the lumbar ones, which are angled slightly cranially. And T11's dorsal spinous process is more or less 90 degrees um, to, the, to the vertebra itself. And that's why it's called the anticlinal, um, anticlinal vertebra. 
Okay, and again, we've covered this already, the, the appearance of the intervertebral foramina versus the lumbar and the cervical area. Just remembering in the lumbar area, the horse's head, it's easily visualized because they open laterally versus the cervical spine, they open ventrolaterally, and that's really not clearly visualized. Here's that little bit on the um, oblique cervical radiographs that I discussed earlier. At the top left here is uh, an image or a picture of a skeletal specimen from ventrally showing the intervertebral foramina opening ventrolaterally there. Again, on the lateral image, we can't see them, but once we oblique the patient, so the patient lies um, in a VD position, and then we just rotate them 45 degrees, either to the left or the right, and this allows us to see this ventrolaterally directed opening of um, the intervertebral foramina. And in these areas, we can look for mineralized disc material um, or other lesions. And so the correct terminology for these oblique views would be a, either a ventral 45 degree left dorsal right oblique or a ventral 45 degrees right dorsal left oblique so um, next we're going to be moving on to the vertebral column evaluation just to see how to systematically evaluate a radiograph of the spine and there's a number of things we look at uh, we look at the number of vertebra we look at the size, shape, and the alignment of the vertebral bodies. For example, demonstrated nicely in this image is that the floor of the vertebral canal is very well aligned and smooth. There's no sudden step formation. We also look at the opacity of the vertebral bodies. We look at the size and the opacity of the intervertebral spaces, as well as the intervertebral foramina to look for mineralized material sitting there. We look at the articulation facets for fractures, for example. And then it's important to always look at the pair of vertebral soft tissues, um, for example, for swelling or gas. Vertebral number um, can vary. It's not that often, but there are definitely variations that can occur, especially six or eight lumbar vertebra. This happens um, in the Dachshund quite often. It's generally not clinically significant, except it may confuse the surgeon if um, they're trying to localize a surgical site and now the dog suddenly has an extra or um, fewer vertebra. The sacrum sometimes may have four um, vertebra and they may be fused or partially fused. And um, the thoracic vertebra, there may sometimes be 12 or 14. And this may be a genuine change that there actually is, are too few or too many, or it can be due to transitional vertebra. And transitional vertebra we'll get to a little bit later. Um, here's an example of the image of a, a sacrum where there is incomplete fusion of um, part of the sacral segments. So in the top image, S1, S2, and S3 are all fused together. In the bottom image, S1 segment has a space in between it and S2, so there's almost a disc space and a foramina forming. So one may be confusing S1 for an additional lumbar vertebra, but what gives it away that it is just an unfused sacral segment is because it also has the same alignment um, as the rest of the sacrum, and that, that is very different from the alignment of the lumbar vertebra. All right, the following is a list of some congenital conditions which we'll be looking at, um, and several of them may just be clinically insignificant, but are, are important to take note of. Okay, so the definition of a transitional vertebra is that it's a vertebra that shares characteristics with those from another location. So it especially occurs at the thoracolumbar and the lumbar sacral area. And um, a good example would be sacralization of L7. Essentially what that means is that L7 is assuming some of the characteristics of the sacrum. It occurs typically in German Shepherds, and it may predispose to corda equina syndrome, which we'll do at a later stage, and it might prevent symmetrical positioning for the, um, of the pelvis for hip dysplasia views, which we'll cover in that section. Lumbarization of T13 just means that T13 assumes some characteristics of the lumbar vertebra, and it might then, for example, lose its ribs, or the ribs might not be articulating completely with it. Or thoracolization of L1 means that L1 is assuming some characteristics of the thoracic vertebra and it might then, for example, have a rib associated with it. 
Right, and so in this example, T13 only has a rib on the right, and on the left, it's got more of a transverse process originating from there. So this is lumberization of T13. T13 essentially part of it wants to become um, a lumbar vertebra. Here's another example of what happens at the bicycle junction. On the left, there's a normal image of L7, and it's got two transverse processes on either side, and then the normal sacrum. The image on the right, the lumbar, last lumbar vertebra, or L7, has a broad misshapen um, transverse process, and on the left-hand side, it's starting to fuse with the sacrum and starting to fuse with the ilium. So in this case, um, there's sacralization of the last lumbar vertebra on, on the left-hand side, as well as on the right-hand side. So L7 wants to become a sacrum, essentially. Here's just a schematic um, picture of what is happening on um, the right-hand side of the image, or the left-hand side of the dog. L7 has fused to the sacrum and also fused to the wing of the ilium. A okay, block um, vertebra is congenital fusion of two adjacent vertebra. It may be complete or partial, and it's due to improper segmentation of embryonal somites. It can cause increased stress on the adjacent vertebra, although it's usually insignificant. And in this um, example over here, L5 and L6 are block vertebra, and they fused um, along their bodies. Hemivertebra are wedge-shaped vertebral bodies. They can have their broad base facing either dorsally, ventrally, or laterally. So, for example, in um, the image, the arrow indicating uh, hemivertebra where the dorsal part um, is wider. And it's due to incomplete ossification of the dorsal or ventral portion of the vertebral body. And it's quite common in the thoracic area or the cranial lumbar spine. Screwtail breeds or the brachycephalic type breeds are usually predisposed. In adults, um, it's usually not significant, but in young dogs, it, might, it may be responsible for cord compression. It might result in scoliosis or lordosis, um, and it can be a weak point, point in the spine. So any patient that might undergo trauma um, where a dog with a normal spine might not have any issues from it, the hemivertebra acts as a weak point and it can predispose to spinal trauma. So, for example, the bottom picture here is just a quite a markedly wedge-shaped hemivertebra um, with the dorsal component wider. And in the image on the right-hand side, this is a lateral hemivertebra with the left lateral aspect of the body being wider and um, resulting in mild scoliosis. This image is a severe example of hemivertebra formation. This hemivertebra indicated by pointer is completely malformed and um, the vertebral floor or the vertebral canal thus is completely disrupted and this patient will definitely have neurological signs. Butterfly vertebra look exactly as the name indicates. Um, it's due to partial cleavage of the vertebral body which is a failure in development of uh, both the chondrification centers. So the central portion of the vertebral body doesn't form. You can clearly see the butterfly shape in this example here. One needs to do a VD view to see it. Um, they are difficult to appreciate on the lateral views. The end plates have a funnel shape, for example, indicated by my little hand here. And the spinous processes might also be malformed or fused. So, for example, the spinous processes caudally here appear normal. The ones within the thoracic um, spine are larger, variable shaped, and they look quite bulky. And again, butterfly vertebrae are more common in the brachycephalic breeds, and they're again usually not clinically significant. Spina bifida refers to the failure of the dorsal portion of the vertebra to form, and that can either be the um, lamina dorsally or the dorsal spinous processes. So, in, for example, here on the left-hand side, there is an obvious radiolucent defect in this last lumbar vertebra um, extending into the sacrum, and on the right, there's cleavage of the dorsal spinous process. So it looks like there's two of them next to each other. 
again, typically in brachycephalic breeds, but also in the Manx cat. In this example, um, the arrows just indicate, again, split spinous processes. And neurological deficits may sometimes occur if the spinal cord is also involved. Sometimes the meninges, with or without the spinal cord, can protrude um, through, through these defects. Okay, Atlanta axial stability um, usually is clinically significant. It occurs in toy breed or small breed dogs, usually at around about a year of age, and the pathogenesis is multifactorial. Um, it could be as a result of a dense fracture, could be due to congenital dense agenesis or hyperplasia, or ligament agenesis of the ligaments that hold the dens in place. And as a result, the dens, which normally lies on the floor of C1, will elevate um, and it can cause narrowing of the vertebral canal at this re region or it may be completely absent and they're resulting in um, instability of the C1, C2 segment. In this example here, the dens is meant to be located in this region where I'm indicating and in this dog it's completely absent and as a result C2 is dorsally elevated or dorsally displaced relative to C1 um, and therefore the vertebral canal becomes malaligned and there might be compression of the cord as a result of this. In this schematic image um, over here I'm just demonstrating how the ligaments may be affected. The white is the, the caudal aspect of the skull, the blue is C1 and the pink is C2. So the dens protruding over here is normally held in place on the floor of C1 by the transverse dens ligament and also has an apical ligament and two alar ligaments that hold it in place. And so part of the pathogenesis of Atlanta axial instability may be a um, absence of any one of those. Um, some special views can be performed um, to look at axo atlanto axial instability. One of them is the open mouth, rostrocaudal view. You can see on this image the mouth is open and the beam is sort of entering into, for lack of a better word, entering the throat area. So C2 here, this is the, its cranial margin. It should have the dens protruding from it over there. In this case, the white line outlines where the dens should be, and one can clearly see that the dens is absent. With the oblique views, for example, this image here, um, one can see a small little dens there, and that's usually a good view to demonstrate the dens as the lateral views should not be um, showing the dens due to superimposition. And then we've briefly discussed the flexed views of the Atlanta axial area, um, one just has to be very careful if there is instability there with excessive flexion, one can actually push the dens into the spinal cord and um, result in worsening of neurological signs. Okay, and then lastly onto spinal trauma, just like any other bone, um, the spine can also be affected by subluxations, luxations, fractures, rotation. Um, the fractures may be minimally displaced and quite subtle. So one really has to care, pay careful um, attention to spinal radiology and technique here. Sometimes multiple views are needed. The spine can be affected by pathological fractures as well. For example, a primary bone tumor or metabolic bone disease. And then often in trauma cases where radiographs might be negative and the patient has severe clinical signs, um, one can go to advanced imaging, maybe not myelography so much, um, but CT and MRI definitely. Now here's an example of a compression fracture. This vertebral body is markedly shortened compared to the adjacent ones, and usually they have um, an increase in opacity because all of that bone is squashed into a smaller area. It's not very well demonstrated on this image because there's a lot of superimposition. So um, this is not a very good example of that. But what this radiograph dem does demonstrate is that this is a skeletally immature animal. One can see that there are open physes um, caudally and cranially, and compression factors are quite common in younger animals. In this example, there is subluxation between C6 and 7, um, and it's best it's demonstrated by the arrow, but it's best seen if you follow the floor of the vertebral canal 
then suddenly there's a step formation dorsally, and that's just demonstrating a subluxation. What's important about subluxations is that they can be quite subtle. For example, in this VD, there's a subluxation between L5 and L6, but it's in a lateral direction. So a lateral radiograph is unlikely to pick this up and might be very, very subtle. So this example just highlights the importance of having orthogonal views performed. Right, in this last image, we've got a, a, a luxation of the tail. So caudal vertebra one is separated from um, the sacrum. A uh, better term might be to be uh, calling it a tail avulsion. Um, and then, sorry, this is the last one. Here we've got a fracture with luxation. There's an oblique fracture demonstrated through the body of L5. And there's marked craniovertebral displacement of the caudal fragment. And the caudal fragment in this case is referring to what's left of L5, L6, L7, the sacrum, and the rest of the pelvis. Right, so that's the end of the general um, or the introduction to spinal radiology, the congenital and the traumatic conditions of the spine, and then we'll continue with the degenerative conditions in the next lecture.